Well, good morning again to you. God bless you. <laughs> Call this meeting to order at this time. <laughs> Especially on this uh, July 4th weekend, we want to recognize all of you and thank you. Those of you that are involved in military service, have been or are, or even uh, are real planning on doing that or on your way, thank you. God bless you. Thank you for, for serving uh, all of us. We appreciate you and we thank you, especially on this weekend, every weekend and every day, really. I think more and more in these days how thankful we are for those who, who stand up for us, who protect us protect our rights and we we honor you today so thank you for all of you yes a few announcements today that are super important because they all involve uh, things that are that are important first of all I want to just give you a little tutorial on how um, this new feature that we are um, that we we have now in terms of how to give works now, a lot of, I don't know how many of you give using uh, the internet at this point, or maybe some of you pay your bills online and do all kinds of things. For, for a certain part of the, uh, of the generation that's getting, getting uh, older at this point, um, this, is, this is commonplace. In other words, to text an amount that you want to give uh, right from your phone is becoming increasingly more um, common. And so we want to uh, allow for that kind of... Uh, uh, expression. There's someone that wants to, to give or set up things online electronically so that um, their giving to their church can happen in a, a no-sweat kind of a way, then this is one of those ways. So we're partnering with something called Faith Street in order to be able to facilitate this kind of service. And so today I'm just going to give you a, a real quick tutorial, and, and then I probably will want, uh, I put some cards in the, uh, in the bulletins, um, so that those of you that want more information about this and you'd like to, to, to take advantage of this, then contact us here at the church office or talk to me before you leave, and we can walk you through this, especially the initial setup of this, uh, at any time, either over the phone or we could walk you through this even right here at the church if you wanted to stop by. And once you kind of set this service up the first time, after that, especially as it relates to the text to give, it's just pretty much... Um, there's a missionary here, uh, you forgot your wallet at home, whatever it is, there you've got your smartphone, and you say, I want to give uh, $50 in the offering today. You pretty much just type in VCC, 50 bucks, boom, you push send, and it's done. That's how quick it is. And, uh, and, and so anyway, let me give you just a quick tutorial. This is how to use uh, on your smartphones text to give. This is our church's giving number. So if any of you have your smartphones now, just want to invite you to put it in your contacts. Even if you don't plan to use this service uh, at this point, maybe at some point you will in the future. So all you have to do is just grab a hold of this number, and if you don't get it today, you can talk to us anytime. We'll make sure that you get it. Also, too, if you don't like to give with a smartphone, but you are online, that is to say you, you can get on the internet at home, you can go to our church Facebook page, the Valley Christian Church Facebook page, and there's a little button there that shows you how to give. It's the same process. It's just that um, rather than texting to give, you're going you're gonna to go uh, into this uh, through our Facebook page. So this is the number. This is our church's giving number. And then, um, ultimately, you text the amount that you'd like to give. You click the link, and this is what takes just, you know, a few minutes, so you probably won't be able to do this right now, but that's why I want you to take that number down and do this if you're interested in doing this uh, at a different time. It takes a few minutes just to kind of fill this out and kind of establish an account for free of your own. Once you click that link, eventually, you're, well, you're going to find that our quick code is just real simple, Valley Christian Church, VCC, right? And then um, you're going to fill out this one-time setup that I had mentioned, right? And in the future, once you've done that, that's when it gets real easy. You just text the amount that you'd like to give, and you're done. 
and you'll get instantly a, a little thank you from us. Thank you for giving. And then this will be recorded, uh, and you'll still get giving credit for it, obviously. And uh, now, here's the, the biggest question. Um, you don't have to try it right at, the, at this moment. But is there a fee? Of course there is. Yes, there's a fee to give this way. Just like an ATM, there's a fee. For credit and debit cards, you can see the amounts there. Uh, but you can choose to have the church deduct that amount from your giving if you choose, or you can pay it yourself when you set up your account. Now, when I did the first time, I gave $5 just to test this thing out. I elected to tack on the service charge on the top of that. That's just what I did. So instead of giving $5, it was like $5.40 or something. So that's how it worked for me. But as soon as I got it set up, it's the easiest thing in the world. You just take your smartphone out. Now, I can see some, some real good applications for this, especially for those of us maybe that aren't uh, carrying around a lot of cash, but you do have a smartphone and you do have it linked up. Once you have this system set up, if the Lord moves on you and you say, wow, I, can't, I don't have anything, but you do have your smartphone and there's a missionary or there's some compelling need all you have to do is take out your smartphone, and there you are. You can text that amount, and it will come. It will be sent to us. See how that works? So we'll talk more about that and give you more practical uh, information about that, but that's what's going on. As it relates to nursery care, we are so grateful for everybody who, who helps in the nursery, uh, but this is always one of those ministries, uh, like many ministries, that, that we're shorthanded in. It's such an important ministry. According to Jesus, he loves children. I don't know if you read that in the Bible yet. Did you see how much he loves children? Oh, he is so protective of his kids. He loves children. And so we ought to have the same heart. Uh, one of the things we want to do in July and August here, just because of being shorthanded, is we want to combine our little angels, which is uh, three years old through pre-K, with our infant to two nursery, which is right over in here just for July and August. There's two sections in there. One can be for the, for the little older kids, and the others can be uh, the, the real little ones. So that's, that's what our plan is right now, just because we just don't have the people at the moment to do that. As we move into the new uh, school year, I'm hoping there'll be more that are qualified people, loving, caring people who love kids who uh, will step forward and uh, will go through all the background checks and, and then be able to be involved in that kind of ministry. But that's just for these next couple months. And then coming up, men's breakfast. How exciting. I put this graphic up here because I thought, what's more manly than having chopped steak and mashed potatoes for breakfast? Maybe that's grits. I don't know what that is. It looked good to me. I, I, all I know, it looked delicious. It looked manly. So for those of you that, uh, what's that? I, I myself will not be here because I'm going to be down at the uh, uh, conference, the uh, BNCA, Bhutanese Nepalese uh, conference. I'll talk about that in just a second. But um, for those that are going to be here, uh, I believe our brother Joseph will be bringing the message, and uh, and uh, our brother Hank, wherever he is, is going to be opening up. And uh, you knew that, right? Yeah. Well, now you know that. So, <laughs> making the coffee, <laughs> and that's this uh, that's this Saturday at eight o'clock. So please come and enjoy that. Uh, that's every every month we have that men's breakfast. And then speaking of which, this is where I will be. Uh, uh, Saturday, along with a couple of others, too. I believe uh, Sundeans are going to be down there helping to uh, drive some of the Nepali people down to this huge conference. This is what our brother, our Pastor Deepak, has been working on along with Susan and Betsy and, uh, and me, but they have done such a, a huge amount of work, in particular, Susan. This is, um, this is the brochure that's going to go in the hands of just about everybody who's going to be there. You can, think, you can just imagine, to build this all from scratch, this is what has been going on, one of the things going on in, amidst many other things at our church. And, and so these folks, could be as many as 3,000 of them, are going to show up in Minneapolis in just a few days, and they're going to be getting this, this program as well as um, uh, our brother David and uh, Cheryl, they're going to be uh, helping to drive people down there, uh, people who are baby Christians, as well as those who've been Christians for just a little while, and even some who are not Christians. And they're going to go to this beautiful church that God has provided in Bloomington, and people are going to hear the gospel. Amen? And young believers are going to be discipled, and they're gonna, their lives are going to be transformed and changed. And so this is such a great investment. And immediately following this great event that we're involved in, I'm going down there too. They're, they're going to have me speak, but I don't really know what that's all about. Cross-cultural ministry is very is challenging in the sense that you have to be real flexible. 
You may think you understand what they're asking you to do, but you never really know until you're on the platform. And even then, you may not know. And this has happened multiple times where I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I just go with the flow, right? I'm just ready to pray or do whatever I need to do, whatever I'm called upon. And I'm, it's always a blessing. It's always a blessing. So be praying for that event because it's going to be pivotal. It's the first time this ever happened. Just, I think it was three or four years ago when we met Pastor Deepak for the first time. He said, this is my vision, that we will be able to have a Bhutanese-Nepali uh, conference here in this northern region for the first time ever. And I remember him telling me that. I thought, wow, that guy's got big vision. He's got a lot of, <laughs> I'm thinking, man, that's a lot to think about. And yet here it is. It's becoming reality in just a few days. Isn't that good? So praise the Lord. So please be praying for safety, for safe travels. People are coming from all over the nation. Some are coming from overseas. It's going to be a big deal. So we appreciate your prayers for that. And then uh, ladies, uh, although I, maybe it's not exclusive just to ladies, but uh, Meth Moore is going to be August 28th and 29th. If you're interested in being a part of a group that would go down there, talk again to us at the church office. Call Susan, call one of us, and we'll give you more details. But if you'd like to be a part of that, let us know. She's going to be real close by. And then today we have a weekly memory. In fact, we, we try to have a weekly memory verse for you. Um, today, our memory verse, which is found in your bulletin, is then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. Even if you can get the substance of that down in your spirit and just kind of memorize that. Uh, in particular, I want you to see the last line. The house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. This is my prayer, that my house will be filled with the fragrance of worship, of love and, and, and worth, uh, ascribed to the Lord. Amen? We All of our houses, wouldn't it be great if our houses spiritually smelled like that, the worship of God? I, I, I pray that it would be that way in this house and in all of our houses. So before we uh, have our, our time today of uh, looking into God's word, I want to invite our ushers forward once again. I want to give our offering offerings to the Lord. And I appreciate you you're doing your best and, and giving today. First of the month is always a real important time for us, for all of our big bills here at the church. I know it is probably for you personally, too. I'm going to pray and, and ask you to, to believe with me for us to be able to meet all of those needs. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we give today, we are trusting that you will help us to meet every need that this house has. And not just for that, Lord, our desire is to continuously expand so that we can give more and more into the kingdom of God and see uh, your word proclaimed in greater and greater ways. So as we give today, we do so in faith, and we trust you, Lord God, to bless us again and again. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you for giving. Do appreciate it. Take a look also, like I said, at your bulletin. There's other announcements in there as it relates to Bible camp and uh, a number of other things that are coming up that might be of interest to you, things that you want to be involved in. One, one thing that, that uh, I have to mention in addition to this, I didn't put it up here, but um, there is going to be a, uh, an event on Thursday, July 23rd, 23rd in the town square downtown. And it's being put on by a group that's an old group but is being revived and becoming uh, kind of the, the hands are, or, or, or the reins are being handed off to younger people now at this point. It used, used to be called Woman's Aglow. Anyone remember that old uh, uh, Woman's Aglow? Well, now it's called Aglow International, and I believe it's co-ed now. And there are some uh, young, uh, younger people who have kind of taken a hold of the leadership of that here in this town, and they've been praying and seeking the Lord, and they felt like God has called uh, us as churches, as many as you feel led to do this, to come together to be able to have public uh, testimonies of people whose lives have been transformed by the gospel and as well as gifted worship leaders to be able to lift up the name of Jesus right outside, right down there in the town square. So they've organized all this and there are people coming from all over the place to be able to make this happen. What I committed us to do is to simply be intercessors, to be people who would be present at this event and just to be praying underneath our breath Lord, bless this event. Please open the hearts of all the people that are passing by 
to come, to stay, to listen to the powerful testimonies that are going to be presented, to hear the music that's anointed, that is, um, that is uh, you know, from the Lord and is directed towards him, and just to be those intercessors that will walk around, that will be there, they'll sit down and just continuously kind of have that connection and say, Lord, please bless this event. So that's our responsibility as a church. If you can make it to that, that's what I'm encouraging you to do. Again, it's uh, July 23rd, um, and it's going from 5 until 10 at night. Even if you can just make it for a little while, you can see all the different activities that will happen down there in addition to that. So let's pray for that uh, and see the Lord do some great things. Amen? So we're talking about knowing Jesus and making him known. Now we're up to John chapter 12. I should let you know, too, that you may see some gaps if you're following this closely and you're saying, well, didn't we skip these few verses since last week? Actually, no. Wednesday nights, we cover uh, some of these as well so that we can continue to move uh, forward. So some of the verses um, in certain chapters we're handling on Wednesday nights in our adult Bible study, which, by the way, if you don't have anything going on on Wednesday nights, we'd love to see you here at 630. We have treats. Treats, yes, treats. So come at 6.30, uh, we have worship, we have our treats together, we have fellowship, and then we always hear the word of God, and it's, it's a blessing. Everyone who comes says it's a really important part of their week. So please uh, avail yourself of that. So today, what are we talking about? Well, open up your bulletins, and if you want to read with me, I would love this, to the back. And let's just start at verse 12, where it begins, chapter 12, and let's read it out loud together. I'm asking even as you read to listen intently, to invite God to speak to you, and to resist the distractions you might have right in this moment, okay? This is God's time. Let's, let's look at this, read this together, and really concentrate. Ready? Here we go. Then, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This, he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always but me you do not have always. Now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus." That last verse there, it says many of the Jews went away. It's saying that they went away from their, their religious traditions, so to speak, their, their trust in what the Pharisees and the other kind of ruling religious class was telling them. They went away from that. They disconnected from that, and they put their allegiance in Jesus. They looked to him to be their leader, their Messiah. That's amazing. And that happened because of that miracle. No wonder those who were opposed to Jesus decided the source of that miracle, or at least the, the, the poster boy for that, who is Lazarus, he needs to go to. He needs to die. It just shows you the, the depth of the depravity that human beings can, can sink to when they, don't, when they choose not to honor God, and they want to ignore what he's doing, and they want to do what they're wanting to do. They have their agenda, right? So, but in the midst of this, this amazing kind of chaos, this conflict of, of interests and, and, and desires where there are people who are putting their allegiance on Jesus and falling in love with him in, in the most wonderful of ways, there's also these people that are so murderous and, and bent on trying to find a way to stop Jesus. In the midst of all of that, 
someone does something that for some would consider it was considered very inappropriate, and yet Jesus considered it extremely appropriate and right. And that is this event that we see where Mary comes and takes this huge amount, uh, by huge I mean like 12 ounces of this immensely expensive perfume in this alabaster jar, some people say, and she just pours it all over Jesus' feet. This is an amazing, amazing situation. But this isn't the first time that this happened to Jesus. Uh, depending on how you, you interpret this, I believe that there were three anointings, three separate times that this took place. Some Bible scholars think that the one that's recorded in Matthew and Mark is the same one as the one that John records here, and that the unnamed woman in Matthew and Mark is actually the same Mary. But I don't think that's the case. I think that uh, because the timeline is off, John says it's six days before Passover, and Matthew and Mark say it's two days. And I think there's a reason for that. So take a look at this. Let's look at these three different occasions. Long before, uh, or sometime before, uh, the event that we just read about, that's number two, John chapter 12, there was another event that took place that's similar. And it's in Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50. It's at Simon the Pharisee's house, and an unnamed woman washes Jesus' feet with her tears, kisses them, dries them with her hair, and anoints them with oil or, or with perfume. So this, is, this happened before this happened. In fact, I want to read this to you uh, out of Luke chapter 7. This is his account. It says, a Pharisee, and in particular Luke wants you to know this is a Pharisee that we're talking about here, invited him, that is to say Jesus, to dine with him. And he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. Now there was a sinful woman in the city. Now here's the only of these three anointings where it says there's a sinful woman in particular. Sinful woman in the city who learned that he was at table in the house of the Pharisee, bringing an alabaster flask of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears. And then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and anointed them with the ointment. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus said to him in reply, Simon, so now we know his name, Simon, I have something to say to you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people were in debt to a certain creditor. One owed 500 days wages and the other owed 50. Since they were unable to repay the debt, he forgave it for both. Which of them will love him more? And Simon said in reply, the one, I suppose, whose larger debt was forgiven. He said to him, you have judged rightly. Then Jesus turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? When I entered your house, you did not give me water for my feet, but she has bathed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but she has not ceased kissing my feet since the time I entered. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with ointment. So I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. For the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. He said to her, your sins are forgiven. The others at table said to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But then he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Can you imagine that scene? How interesting that would have been, how awkward that would have been. There already should have been, or, or there was a sense in that society that there's a, a big barrier, an invisible barrier between men and women anyway, let alone a rabbi, let alone a single rabbi, right? G Jesus. And this woman comes in who is known to be a sinner. We don't know what that means, but it doesn't matter. She's a sinner. And we know that she gets that close to Jesus, and he does not push her away. That would have been something that the rabbis would have done normally. They'd have probably taken that, their bare foot and just <laughs> put it on her forehead and pushed her away and said, get away from me, foul whatever. Lady, you need to get out of here. I'm not going to be defiled by this. How did she get in here, right? But not Jesus. So there's a whole lot to talk about just in that particular thing. The second anointing, I believe, happened as it's recorded in John chapter 12. We already read that one. We think it's at Lazarus and Martha's home. The Saturday before Good Friday in Bethany, Mary anoints his feet and dries them with her hair. Again, there's this drying with the hair. 
And then finally, Matthew and Mark, Mark and Matthew, report a third anointing, in my opinion, at Simon the leper's home by an unnamed woman the Wednesday before Good Friday. Maybe by Mary again, we don't know, but this time his head is anointed instead of his feet. So this is, this is just to kind of help us to understand and put this all in perspective. I'll read the short passage here of uh, Mark, who talks about this, what I believe is a third anointing. The Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were about to take place in two days' time. So the chief priests and the scribes were seeking a way to arrest him by treachery and put him to death. They said, not during the festival, for fear that there may be a riot among the people. When he was in Bethany, reclining at table in the house of Simon the leper, now this guy's name is Simon, but he's not a Pharisee, he's a leper. I have a feeling that you couldn't be a Pharisee and still be a leper. You'd be unclean, right? The Pharisees are the separated ones, the holy ones. I think you'd be out of a, a job as a Pharisee if you contracted, lep contracted leprosy. This is, this is my theory anyway. Um, he was here at the house of Simon the leper. A woman came with an alabaster jar of perfumed oil, costly, genuine spikenard. She broke the alabaster jar and poured it on his head. There were some who were indignant. Why has there been this waste of perfumed oil? It could have been sold for more than 300 days' wages and the money given to the poor. They were infuriated with her. Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, and whenever you wish, you can do good to them, but you will not always have me. She's done what she could. She has anticipated anointing my body for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed to the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. It's possible that this lady was also Mary, and that she came and did this again. But either way, it appears to me that there's three different anointings. Now look at the contrast. When Simon the Pharisee sees a woman come and do something that seems inappropriate, he begins to think these judgmental thoughts. If this man, referring to Jesus, is really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman that is. And then Jesus had to take advantage of that situation and teach. However, in the house of Simon the leper, he doesn't seem to make any, any kind of complaint at all about this. It shows you that if you're someone who knows that you are lost without the Lord, you're less likely to be uh, judgmental to others. I mean, honestly, so there's some people that spend their time on the internet trying to find other people who are doing something wrong, and they'll just, they love to post about it. They love to say, this pastor's doing this wrong, this prophet's doing this wrong, blah, 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 blah. and they go on and on, and I'm thinking, do you not have enough work to take care of yourself? <laughs> Seriously, I think that. I think you, really? You're going after this minister and that minister online? Do you really think that's your ministry? Why not look at yourself? Again, there is a time for correction. I agree. I think that there's a time to point out and name names from time to time. But honestly, I think if you really are looking at yourself, you realize that without the Lord, you are <laughs> filled with spiritual leprosy. Right? You're Simon the leper. You're not Simon the Pharisee. You, you, you want to you you stay on that side of things. He, he, he didn't complain. Others that were present were indignant and said, this is a waste. How dare he allow this? Simon the leper didn't mind. I think because he's aware. When you know that you've been forgiven much, Jesus said you love much. Right? When you're aware that you were lost in sin without the Lord, you don't have a whole lot of time to be pointing fingers at others. The only reason you might get angry about sin around you is because you're angry at the way that it's hurting other people. And you know that there, but for the grace of God, go you. Amen? That's the attitude I think that the Lord is, is wanting us to have. We know that we ourselves have enough to deal with without pointing a finger at someone else. Now look at this. Passionate worship is awkward, yet it's beautiful to the Lord. Look at the expression on her face here. I mean, again, these are all artist representations, but I can only imagine what it would be like to take, you know, your inheritance or, or everything you've got tied up in this, in this costly thing. I mean, to something that's worth 10 grand, essentially. That's a lot of money, right? This is expensive inside this beautiful alabaster uh, jar, what some, some versions say box, but it's like this container that's made out of, uh, I think they say gypsum, uh, or so it's very thin and beautiful, and in there goes this precious ointment, 
that's worth a whole lot of money. In several of these instances, it's worth a year's worth of wages. This is really expensive stuff. And can you imagine what happened when all of this is poured out on the feet or on the head of Jesus? The whole house is so filled with this smell that it's making everyone's eyes burn. I'll bet it was. I mean, think of how pungent, how, how amazingly, you use the word aromatic, I don't know. I mean, this must have really, can you imagine what this was like? And this was awkward. I mean, I, I think of what, the way it is in the movies, and it's always so lyrical and beautiful, and, and everything just, you know, everyone's, you know, looking up at the right time, Lord, and everyone's got down, at the, everyone's pouring it beautifully at the right, but I think it was a mess is probably what it was. And I think it's the same way with our worship sometimes. It's, it's like, a, it's a mess. It's kind of awkward. It's, it's, and that's okay. And that's okay. Because you notice the Lord didn't say, ah, that's, that's a nice idea. You might want to pour that mm, in sections next time and not, not do, and Jesus didn't give her any correction, any of these ladies at any time, did he? He appreciated the extravagant, passionate uh, act of worship. And I would say that's a lesson to all of us. It can be awkward. Maybe there's some of you that, for you, lifting your hands before the Lord is really a stretch. And that's okay. I want to invite you to begin to pour out more upon the Lord when it's time to worship and we're in this group together. Or maybe just by yourself to begin with. Lift your hands to God. It's, it's an offering. It's a surrender. It's, it's, an, it's an act of saying, Lord, I'm yours. I surrender all to you. Right? Whatever that means to you, it is something of pouring out before the Lord. Instead of keeping it inside the bottle here, you're pouring it out. Maybe for you it's singing out a little bit. Maybe you just rarely sing in times of worship. Because you say, well, I don't know the song, or it's too high, it's too low, it's too this. or you know, I'm just kind of tired on Sunday mornings. I came here not to really give out, but to receive. I get it. But I want to I invite you, I want to challenge you to begin to pour out what's on the inside of you as a vessel. A little bit more. Even if it's just a little bit, challenge yourself to give more in your time of worship. It may feel awkward to you. It was awkward to them. And yet the Lord was very pleased with it. I want to encourage you with that thought. So what are our roadblocks to passionate, heartfelt, costly worship of Jesus? I think fear of man is a big one. I struggle with this one. You don't want to offend other people, right? So you're afraid of what other people think. What about uh, awareness of your own unworthiness and sinfulness? Can you imagine what it was like for the first lady at that first anointing to know that she's sinful and she runs the risk of getting literally beaten up? I mean, I wouldn't put it past those Pharisees to slap a woman around. If they were willing to stone them in the streets, they're certainly willing to sock them in the face and tell them, get out of here. All because in their minds they thought they were being separated unto God and righteous. And why would they allow that kind of trash into their services, into their homes, right? She took a big risk, but even her own unworthiness was not enough. Her sense of the worth of Jesus exceeded, was greater than her own sense of unworthiness. And that's where we have to be, amen? Jesus is more worthy to receive praise than I am unworthy to offer it. You can tweet that. Do you, anybody tweet in here? That was a really good line. What I just said, that was a good one. I, I forgot what I said already. It was so good. Okay? Jesus is more worthy to be praised than our unworthiness to offer that praise. That wasn't as good as the first time. You've got to really listen because, you know, when it comes, you just you got to write it down quick. Okay. Number three, embarrassment. Can you imagine how embarrassing this would have been? Embarrassing. I heard a, an instance where there were two ladies, um, one who was in spiritual, she was in leadership, and then there was another one in this women's ministry who was kind of an assistant, but they, were, they started to butt heads all the time. That is to say, they were always in arguments, there was a little nitpicking thing, and the leader was always thinking, oh, I don't know why this lady just seems to, it's like we're sandpaper, we're always, we always have a problem. I'll say we should do this in the women's ministry, and this lady will say, um, well, I don't think we should do that. You know, because, well, we've never done it that way. We should do it this way. And so there was always this kind of rub. So finally, this lady who was in greater leadership over the one who, who was more of an assistant 
thought to herself, I want to be like Jesus. And I know what I'm going to do. When we have our meeting next time, I'm going to bring a basin of water and I'm going to wash her feet because I want to be like Jesus. And, and I want to humble myself. And so she did. She brought this basin of water in at the next women's ministry meeting. And she got down there, and it's a holy moment. And she's crying, and, and, and other ladies are crying. And then she notices the ladies got pantyhose on. Now what do you do? <laughs> right? It's awkward. She's trying to do the right thing, right? And it was difficult. And now this lady that she thought she was going to be doing such a blessing, a wonderful thing, now got all these, these soggy feet. Because, of course, what do you do? She went through with it, put her nylons in there, and uh, now she's got soggy feet. And it, it you know, didn't turn out the way she intended, but it was something she did with the right heart. And I have a feeling that these scenes are, are more embarrassing than what we realize. What about the cost? That's a lot of money tied up in those things, wasn't it? At least in two of the three instances, the oil that was expended, the, the, the amount of money that was poured out for something that lasted just a couple minutes was a, was a lot. How would you love to walk in and just give a $10,000 offering? And, and, and wouldn't that, I mean, it'd be great. <laughs> I'd, I'd love that. But I'm saying, I mean, to do it in a, in a sense where people are kind of mad at you and saying, you know what, you could have spent that someplace else. I don't know why you wasted all that money right? What about our own religiosity and the potential disapproval of others? Even our own sense of what is decorum sometimes will, will kind of drop us down in terms of really worshiping the Lord and really giving ourselves. I'm not talking about the outward expression. I'm talking about actually allowing the, our spiritual emotions to be released to the Lord. And then finally, I'm just calling it the Judas spirit. I'm not saying it's an actual spirit, but it's an attitude right? The attitude that Judas manifested is the same attitude that others who were around him manifested. This happened in three different times. And I think any time there's extravagant worship, that is to say any time there is really a, a love for God that is expressed, even if it's quiet, there's going to be that Judas spirit l lurking around. And it'll say, you know what? You probably could do something better with your time right now. Or you know what? You're spending a lot of energy for what? What's so important here? And I could talk about that. We'll talk about that more in just a second here. So how did these women push past those barriers? Because we got to push past those barriers too, don't we? If we want to be worshipers, the kind that the Father is seeking, isn't that what it says in John 4? The Father seeks the kind of people who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So how do we push past? The, the, these are my thoughts. First of all, they definitely put their focus on Jesus, didn't they? You get the impression that they just had a laser beam focus. They walked through. The servants are saying, what are you doing? You, you can't be in here. But they just, they just pushed past it. Maybe even uh, some other people said, hey, 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 what are you doing? You're not bringing the food. Where, where's the food tray? Whoa, you're not a servant. What are you doing with that oil? What, why are you getting close to the rabbi? You get the impression you didn't hear the gospel writers writing down that they said anything, but they had their focus on Jesus. They just went right to him. Because they knew what they wanted to do. They wanted to pour out their worship upon the Lord. The other thing is they humbled themselves. In all three of these instances, even the one where, where they pour the oil on Jesus' head, there's this sort of humbling. In two of the three, they've got to be down on their knees to be able to make this happen. He's reclining at table, right? He's laying down. The feet are out here. And if you're going to wipe them, I, I don't know how long their hair must have been, but, you know, you're going to have to get down there to be able to use your hair, unless you're Crystal Gale. Isn't she the one that had, like, hair down to the floor? Still, you know, you're going to have to get down there if you're going to use your hair to, uh, to wipe someone's feet. They humbled themselves. Number three, they turned their backs to all the distractions. We kind of mentioned that. If you're at the feet of Jesus, your accusing voices are behind you. They made a decision to empty themselves. They didn't go in there with the idea, I've got a lot of nice precious oil here. I think the Lord would really be pleased with a tenth of this or even 50% of this. They went in with the idea that they were going to break, even one of them broke that thing and said, it's not going to be good for anything else. I'm going to waste all this on the Lord. Every bit of it is going to be his. Number five, here's another thing that helped them to push past the barriers. They love Jesus more than they love themselves. 
Uh, sometimes that's my fundamental problem. I love myself more than I love the Lord. I love my own comfort zone, my own security, right? More than I love to focus on him. Number six, they recognized the worth of Jesus and they acted correspondingly. They really did. They thought, Jesus, you're worthy of this kind of treatment. Really what that Judas spirit is saying is Jesus is not worthy of your outlandish and extravagant display. And that's why it's wrong. Because if anybody's worthy of it, Jesus is, right? Because he gave his all to us. It's only right that we would give our all to him. Number seven, they were simply responding with gratitude and they had no idea that they were performing a prophetic act inspired by the Holy Spirit. They were just doing what was right in the moment. They were, they were worshiping and, and doing something that was beautiful and, but yet awkward and messy. But Jesus actually said, they don't realize this but they're anointing my body for burial right now. They are doing something that says something. It's called a prophetic act, for lack of a better term. A prophetic act is something that is an action, but it says something. Prophetes in Greek means to speak forth. Does that make sense? So you can say something without saying something. You say something sometimes with your actions more than you say it with your words, right? So they were saying something prophetically as they anointed his feet and anointed even his head. It was like they were anointing him for burial. They were declaring that he would die, but in a sense they were saying he will live again. Just all in that prophetic act, whether they realized it or not. How about this? Here's a truth. Jesus defends those who lavish love upon him. Notice in all three instances, he did not let the accusers, the indignant ones, uh, he didn't let that just go. He didn't let them beat up on those ladies. He stood up for them. He stepped in the middle and said, whoa, 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 whoa wait a minute. Now you're getting all pious and saying that, what about the poor? He's thinking, look, you know, the poor were here yesterday and you weren't taking a whole lot of money out of your pocket then. Now someone else comes with their money, with their offering. It has nothing to do with you, and they pour it all out on me. And now all of a sudden you're concerned? You see the hypocrisy there? That's that Judas spirit. And it's something that we have to fight against. But Jesus defends those who lavish love upon him. This is one of the reasons why it's a good thing to be a worshiper. It's nice to have Jesus on your side, right? <laughs> I'll leave it from there. The Judas spirit and the heart of worship are eternal enemies. I think this is the case. I have a heart of worship. It's always going to come in conflict with, with this attitude, this indignant attitude. There's something better you could be doing. You are wasting your time to worship the Lord. And, and it comes in a much more subtle form than that. But it's something that we have to fight against because it sounds so spiritual in the moment. In fact... The Judas spirit, it sounds more spiritual, more practical than those who are extravagant worshipers. In the moment, it does. It seems to be more decent and in order in the moment many times, but it's kind of masquerading. I say the Judas spirit is revealed when worshipers are present with what? An indignant attitude? I think this is one thing. Number two, I think this Judas attitude thinks extravagant worship is wasteful. I think there's this pseudo-righteousness that takes place. Like I said, suddenly you're all pious. I think also there's a sort of false social gospel shaming. That's just the way I said it. Now, I believe in the social gospel because if the gospel is not penetrating into society, it's not the gospel. But there is a thing that sometimes is used, uh, we call it just the social gospel. It's where folks say, I'm not going to preach the gospel. I'm not going to say anything about... Uh, about Jesus, I'm just going to do good works, acts of compassion, and that will be far more spiritual than if I'm saying something about Jesus. There's this strange kind of thing that happens sometimes. We see it a lot in our, in what you might call liberal churches. Uh, there's this tendency to say, here's what's valuable. This is actually doing something. You folks over here who are worshiping and maybe talking about Jesus, preaching the gospel, saying it, you know what, that's just kind of empty. That's not, you know, you could be using your resources over here. Sometimes there's a sense of shaming. 
Now, I've had a chance of, to get together with folks who are, um, who are part of various denominations who, if they came in, even in a, in a very tame service like we had this morning, where some people have their hands raised, some people are worshiping, some people have a, a tear coming down out of their eye, would say, not my speed. <sighs> That's too emotional for me. Something about that is just not, not pious enough, not respectful to God. I've seen this kind of attitude before, and it, and it, and it reminds me of this. It reminds me of this. There's a, a shaming that goes on if, if you're willing to talk to some of those folks. Okay, number five, secret hypocrisy. Look at what Judas was doing. If anybody didn't have a right to say anything about what true worship is, he didn't have anything to right to say. He had no right to say it, did he? He was actually stealing. He was stealing out of the money bag. So here he is saying, you should use this, this, this particular offering of worship. It's too much to go to the Lord. I can put it to better use, and I'll take my cut at the same time, right? <laughs> So there's secret hypocrisy in this Judas spirit. And finally, there is a lack of awareness of the precious presence of the Lord. Notice Jesus said this way. He said, the poor you have with you always, but me you're not going to always have. I think that's something about that Judas attitude. It doesn't recognize just how precious the Lord is and how worthy he is to be praised. Instead, it diverts our focus off of the Lord. You know, I just put this down. It's possible to minister unto the Lord. Did you know that? Scripture uses that term a couple times, but I, you know, I don't, I think, wow, the Lord to be ministered to? I mean, he doesn't need anything, so why would we have to minister to him? And yet, there is a way to minister to him. Isn't that wild? This ministered to him. This touched his heart. And since he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, I believe that when we pour out our worship upon him, it ministers to him. It touches his heart. It blesses him. Amen? Amen. It's possible to minister to the Lord. I want to say this too. Every Mary models something about worship to us. I don't have time to get into this, but it's something about, you know, the, the, the name Mary is so common in this time frame. But each Mary shows us something about worship. Mary, the mother of Jesus, says, you know, be it done unto me according to your word. That shows us something about the, the sort of the attitude that Mary had, Mary, the mother of Jesus. She gives us a, a glimpse into the heart of a worshiper. Mary Magdalene gives us a sense of, of a heart of a worshiper in that she's willing to say, Lord, everything that's in me that's not of you, let it be removed. And then commission me. I'll do what you want and I'll, I'll stay with you no matter what. There's something about her attitude. She was at the cross when a lot of people were not, right? She was filled with devils before, but she was delivered by Jesus. There's something about her life, the little that we know about it, that tells us something about worship. And of course, Mary, the uh, brother or the sister, I should say, of Lazarus, tells us something about that too. She's always found at the feet of Jesus. She's the one that's moving his heart. She's the one that says, I'm taking everything I've got and I'm pouring it out before the Lord in gratitude. I love him and I value what he says so much that even if other things fall apart, I'm going to come and sit at his feet. That shows us something about a worshiper. Amen? Now this, uh, another part, this part of this is just uncomfortable for me to think about because this there's something about this that's just wild. Now I'm, I'm told, and I, as I read in some commentaries, and we're almost done here today, um, some commentaries that for a servant, a female servant, to use her hair as a towel was not that uncommon. And this wouldn't have been considered that much of a breach of, of etiquette or considered something strange or erotic or something. In this instance, it's, it's the kind of thing that um, wouldn't have been so uncommon. And yet, for a rabbi, this would have been strange, to say the least. Now, there's this obscure passage in 1 Corinthians that says, the long hair of a woman is her glory. And, and I'm, you know, again, this is just me, but I'm kind of tying these two together, and I'm thinking there's something about saying the glory that God has given me, that is to say that the glory means heaviness or weightiness, excellence, whatever good is on the inside of me, I 
am giving that to the Lord. There's something about uh, uh, as it relates to the to the hair there and how uh, they use that in order to be able to uh, make their um, offering of worship complete. Something to meditate on. Also, here's the other thing: worship is never an interruption for Jesus. Isn't this interesting? He may have, may have been in mid sentence. He may have had a bite full of uh, of food at that moment. Um, he could have been right in the middle of drinking, but this worship, all three of these acts were not an interruption to him. He didn't say, that's so nice of you, sister. Can you just wait? I'm almost done, okay? Almost done with my teaching, and then I'd be happy for you to come back and do your anointing thing. Thank you so much. He didn't even do that. He just let her barge right in, all three instances. What does it say to us? Worship is not an interruption to Jesus. What a privilege. We can worship him at any time. Amen? Lots of paintings of this. I already talked about this. Contrast the two Simon's responses. Simon the leper says, hey, let her come on in. Simon the Pharisee, however, says, uh, that's not cool, right? And then uh, almost finally here, our, our ideas of what worship likes are over-glamorized. I always think of like the, the different Marys beautiful like this, right? We always think Mary Magdalene is this person that comes out of sin, but she's absolutely gorgeous. And when she comes in, she's able to just do all these beautiful things in such a beautiful, uh, ordered kind of a way. But the, 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 the fact is, it may look more like this, you know, a desperate person. Mary Magdalene was filled with, with devils. I'm not saying she's one of the ones that anointed Jesus, but I'm saying she's a model of, of these kind of people that were willing to come and to lay their lives down in front of Jesus. And you know what? I'll bet it was messy, and I'll bet it wasn't as beautiful as what we see on, on TV or in movies, but it nevertheless is something that is beautiful to the Lord. So this is where we conclude. I, a little prayer that I, I just say we could, we could pray together. And uh, let's pray together. You ready? Lord, help me to pour all my worship upon you, regardless of cost or consequences. Amen. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, you've given us so much. And so it's only right that we give back to you a portion of what we've given to you of what you've given to us. And Lord, we thank you that these ladies give us this enduring example. At least one of them, you said, her story will be told forever. As long as the gospel is preached, her story will live on. And so we ask that you would transform us into those worshipers. You'd kindle a fire of love for you that will never be extinguished, that you would transform us into houses of prayer, houses of praise, houses of worship, houses of purity, that all of us, Lord God, would learn to be the kind of worshipers that touch your heart. So I'm praying, Lord, you'd make us a church full of people like that, as individuals, as families, and of course, when we come together. We love you and we honor you, Jesus, and we ask, unfold your beauty to us that we might respond in ever-increasing ways to you. We worship you today and we thank you. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face to shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and grant us his peace and his power, his presence and his protection. And may we become truly authentic worshipers, pouring out all that we have upon him because he's worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being here today. God bless you. Appreciate you. Got some treats for you waiting out there. Stick around. Say hello to each other before you have to go. Bye-bye.